but I think our ancestors loved meat. They're hacking off massive pieces of meat whenever they had access to do it, and they start eating meat. But we don't see this huge change because it's all about nutrient density and bioavailability. Meat is much more nutrient dense than the plants, uh, you know, the fruits and the and, and and the vegetables that they were while that they were harvesting or, or, or foraging for. But it's one of the least nutrient dense parts of an animal. When we start hunting at two million years ago, so almost a full million and a half years later than when we started eating meat, when we start hunting is when we see massive body and brain growth. I mean, that's what we see. So when we start hunting, the difference is when we're scavenging, we're eating the leftover meat from the predator. When we're hunting, we're the predator. We have first access to the entirety of that animal. We as the hunter are looking at the animal that we just harvested and say, what do we want to eat? And then we can dive in and eat the blood, the fat, and the organs. The same thing I know that you're finding. I know that Mary's finding. I know that you know every, anybody doing this sort of work is finding with, with groups around, hunter-gatherer groups around the world. They relish those same parts of the animal that the other predators, like on the African savanna, did. So that what fueled, in my mind, the um, massive body and brain growth that we see that end, ended up creating us as a species, as modern day Homo sapiens, is uh, the blood, the fat, and the organs, and some meat, and doing wonderful things to whatever wild vegetable resources we had access to to make them as safe and nourishing as possible. And and I know we always forget this, and certainly insects. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. I hope everyone's having an amazing week. Had a great Thanksgiving. This was such a great episode with Dr. Bill Schindler once again. I've had him on twice before. Go back and listen to those. And of course, go back to episode one. That's where it's all at. You start from the beginning. You listen to them all. You get the entire experience. You get the full journey. Also, give us a review on iTunes. Please get the Peak Human Podcast up in the charts. Let people know that you like it. Trying to get to a thousand reviews. That helps us get visibility. It also helps us get better guests. Some of these big guests want to see that people actually listen to this podcast. And yes, people do. We have tens of thousands of listeners each episode. Really thankful for everyone making this all possible. Really love to hear from you, all the feedback. Really love that people are supporting the podcast. It's still up on Patreon. You can support Peak Human on Patreon. You can support us at nosetail.org. We are just getting over our shipping issues and should be shipping out to more states. But if you are in or near Texas, you can get some meat. If you're anywhere in the U.S., you can get our great Biltong, the South African jerky product. You can get seasonings. You can get the body care products. You can get all that stuff now. Some of that stuff even in Hawaii and Alaska, actually. Get the Biltong and the Drovors and the one with liver in it. The Livervores, our new one. Best way to eat liver. South African version of beef jerky. Amazing stuff. No sugar, no funny stuff. Body care products out of the beef tallow and the seasonings, the clean seasonings. And if you're in Texas, you get the meat, get the organ meat mixed in to the ground beef. Our bone broth is something special. I'd take a look at that. That's all at nosetail.org. Thanks, everyone. Now a little bit more about Dr. Bill. I'll just wing this one. Dr. Bill Schindler is a founder of Eat Like a Human. He's the author of Eat Like a Human. He is a archaeologist a food scientist, a chef, a paleoanthropologist. He used to be a professor at Washington College. He used to be the director of the Eastern Shore Food Lab. He was on The Great Human Race, a Nat Geo show. He's done so many things. He travels the world studying cultures. He does speaking engagements around the world. He is the man. You're going to love this episode. We get into so much interesting stuff. We learn why humans aren't designed to eat meat originally, yet we've overcome that. And now it's vital to keeping us healthy and allowing us to live long and have full bioavailable nutrition. He talks about the dangers of plant foods, talks about how ancient cultures have always detoxified these plant foods and made them safe and found a safe way to include them in their diet. We talk about eating nose to tail. We talk about eating the blood and the organs and the fat. We talk about why our relationship with food is so wrong these days and how to fix it. Enough out of me, let's get straight to it. Enjoy this one with Dr. Bill. 
All right. We are back again with Dr. Bill Schindler. What's going on, my friend? How are you, Brian? It is good to talk with you. Yes, it's always good to talk to you. We got to talk with Mary Ruddick from Mexico City recently. That's right. I was in Ireland when we talked. You were in Ireland doing your thing. We are in Mexico City doing our thing. We're just traveling the world trying to understand cultures and what they eat and how they make food nourishing and safe, as you put it. Absolutely. And we're learning. So you know what the great thing is? We have only scratched the surface. There is so much still to learn. There is. It's endless. That's why you're on again. We've had two episodes <laughs> already. People can go back and listen to the old ones. I always say go back to episode one. This is a whole journey that I've been on for four years now, talking to great people like Dr. Bill. And I think it's really valuable to start from the beginning, get the whole experience. It's like a story unfolding. But definitely go back with Bill. You Maybe you could catch us up a little bit for those who haven't uh, been introduced to you yet and who aren't going to go back just yet. They can watch this episode, then go back. <laughs> catch, catch them up on, on what, 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 I'm, what we're you, working on You, who now, you or... are. Who you are, oh, what you do. okay. Absolutely. So I am, uh, gosh, I, I'm, a, I'm an archaeologist and anthropologist by training. So my work is focused on looking at the archaeological record to understand our ancestral dietary past. And just like you and Mary and so many other amazing people, um, sort of doing the Weston Price thing and, and, and going around and, and, and looking at and, and living with and learning from amazing traditional and indigenous cultures around the world that still have so much incredible information to share with us. And unfortunately, that's continuing to die out. And, and luckily for the work that you're doing, the work that Mary's doing, what I'm trying to do, capturing some of that information, not only just for the uh, what's the word for, for sort of the intellectual curiosity aspect of it, but because they're real lessons that we can apply today in our lives to eat the most nourishing food possible. So um, I have spent most of my life as an archaeologist, anthropologist, and more recently have, have been trained as a chef and I'm trying to merge all of those worlds together uh, to it started as a way to try to nourish myself and my family. But now I'm finding that, as, as you know, that that information is so valuable we're trying to share it with everyone that we can. And one way is through uh, one of the reasons we're talking today, the book, Eat Like a Human, which just came out a few days ago. And I'm super excited about it. Damn. I got it right here. It's amazing. I was just trying to finish it uh, right before we started talking. <laughs> I love it because I know you, I know all your content and it's so great to get it all in one book polished. It must be so satisfying to get it out there to the world. It is. It's, and I know you're engaged in so many projects. You know, do, these are labors of love, and there's so much that we want to say and share. And even though we have it in our heads in a certain way, getting it out in a way that's digestible and understandable and meaningful to somebody else, that's the real trick, right? Um, and luckily, I've I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by amazing people. My wife and my family, you know, number one, and and but for this book as well. I, I'm used to, I'm an academic. I'm used to writing academic papers, which, you know, we academics write all the time and like four people read what we write. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not meant for, it, it's more of an intellectual exercise and, and to dot T's and or dot I's and cross T's and, and sort of play that game. But the reality is this was a book, this is information that I wanted to get across in a way that was meaningful and relevant to some, to, to, more, to as many people as possible. So there was a woman uh, by the name of uh, Wendy Clark, who was the um, at the college at Washington College where I used to work. She was the publicity person. So she was the one if a newspaper wanted to cover something that I did or, or whatever. She was the one who was the intermediary or helped write the press release. She was, we worked together for almost 10 years. She was very familiar with my work. She's an incredible – she's magic with words. And she helped me take my academic writing and make it something that was uh, more digestible. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of credit to her. And I hope I hope it worked. I really do. Oh, it's great. No, I, I love the story part. Each chapter starts out with I love it. Actually, it takes me back to English class in like 10th grade when they, they teach you how to start and you capture the audience. And you have like these great opening sentences that just capture you and bring you into a little story. And then you get to go along the journey with you. So that's what we should do now. Because I did a YouTube video of some of the stuff we filmed with you uh, mm -hmm. fr from years ago. And it, you started out by saying, we have no business eating meat. And it's so <laughs> funny because this YouTube video has been online 
for three years, probably no two years. And people are so confused because I, you know, I support animal based diets and like they come to my channel and they're like, who's this professor saying we have no business eating meat, but there's so much more context there. Right. So the con the comment section is a little weird, but explain it, how we've overcome our human bodies. Yeah, that's, I, yeah, I love the way you say that. And it's so difficult to say, you know, those statements, I, I, I fully believe this. We have no biological business our, to e eating meat. Our teeth are not, I don't care what anybody says, our teeth are not designed to run out and, and rip carcasses apart uh, on the African savanna and properly get all the nutrients we can from the meat. I, it, it's not. But the and most people stop after a statement like that and say, oh, my gosh, who is this guy? Or, well, if they're a vegan, they're, they're, they're in, you know, in line with what I'm saying. But you know, most of the people, oh, what is this guy talking about? Because that's by itself, that statement really doesn't mean anything. And, and, and really, one of the things I wanted to get across in this book and every time that we talk and the, no statement can stand, especially something as complicated as human human diet and health and our relationship with food, no single um, you know catchy statement is meaningful without all the other context that's needed behind it. So, yeah, we are not designed to eat meat. However, however, and here's the important part: we, I truly believe, we built our species, we built our bodies, we built our brains on the back of an animal-based diet. Right. We need it. And if it wasn't for the for the incredible, incredible nutrients and those nutrients that are so bioavailable in the forms of, of animals, especially blood, fat and organs, we would have never been able to support the massive body and brain growth that our species underwent for millions of years to create create modern day homo sapiens. So then then everybody's left confused. Like, well, what does that mean? He says we shouldn't eat meat, but we require a diet you know, that, that included meat in it to be here today, to even have this conversation, what does it all mean? And the basis of it is this, we humans are incredibly weak species. We're incredibly weak and we have an incredibly inefficient digestive tract. So what we do as humans, and we do it really well, and we've been doing it for millions of years, is modifying our environment. We've been creating technologies, stone tools, fire, pottery, you know, a long time ago, and now it's things like cell phones and dishwashers and air conditioners, modifying our environment to uh, create this, this human environment that we, that we live in. And as far as diet's concerned, we created technologies that allowed us to overcome those limitations, overcome the lack of huge canines, overcome the lack of speed, overcome the fact that we can't fly, overcome these incredibly inefficient digestive tract and access awesome resources from our environments that we have no business eating, and transforming them into their safest and most nourishing forms possible for our bodies. And we did such a good job of that. We out ate our digestive tract. We overcame our teeth and our nails and these weak physiques and built awesome bodies on the backs of those technologies. So to me, and we've lost this now, right? The modern food industry processes food at the expense of nutrients, not to make them more nutritious or more bioavailable at the expense of it. We've lost this. So now here we are, in those same incredibly weak bodies with incredibly inefficient digestive tracts, trying to navigate a foodscape, a food system that is not providing nutrients in their right state for our bodies and asking the question, why? Why am I not healthy? Why am I suffering from all this, this metabolic disease? Why, why, why? And the answer is, the answer lies in the past. The answer lies in understanding how our ancestors and how traditional and indigenous groups around the world still today take raw materials from their environments, do something to them, and make them as safe and nourishing as possible for our bodies to enjoy true nourishment. Well, that's what we are as a species. We're the smartest species. We're the sapien means smart, right? I mean, brain. And, and, yep. and we, yeah, we modify our environment. So just to make sure people understand this, because it still sounds kind of wrong when you say we have an inefficient digestive system, but our digestive system but changed because we had access to such good nutrition. So explain that part of the, the mm -hmm. small intestine okay. versus a large intestine, because I think it's still not making sense to new people to this. It makes sense to me. Okay. I know your content. Okay. So let's, let's back up for just a minute. Um, first off, uh, we, we regard ourselves, our, uh, humans as omnivores, which means we eat from all over the food chain, right? We eat, we eat plants, we eat, uh, animals, we eat dairy, you know, we can eat all these different foods. We're omnivores and that's true. 
but we're not omnivores by design. God, a greater power, whatever you believe in, did not put human, and even evolution, did not put humans on this planet and give us the biologically equipped bodies to handle all those different foods. Think about it. I mean, yeah, we eat bread, but go out and start eating grains off a stalk in a field, and you're going to get incredibly sick, right? Um, or I mean, what, whatever the food is. We're not designed to, to eat those foods. We are omnivores by technology. We we do things to the food to allow it to be safe and nourishing for our body. So that's why we're omnivores. Now, when you, you st- the one the one food, the one food that I truly believe humans are perfectly designed to consume, that we're perfectly, you know, we're fully equipped to safely and efficiently derive the maximum amount of nutrition from when we eat it is one thing. And that is raw milk from our mothers when we're infants. So for a short period of, our, of time, we're mammals, right? That's what we are. We are biologically equipped to drink milk directly from our mothers. That's raw. It's already in the process of fermenting. Our bodies are producing the enzymes required to do everything it needs to do to that dairy to make it as safe and nourishing as possible. And that system works great. When, we wean our, when, when we're weaned off of that, that dairy as infants, just like all other mammals, we begin to lose the enzymes and the biological processes to most effectively make use of that dairy, and we, we start eating other foods. Now, as far as those other foods are concerned, you know, if you go back in time pre-tool, before we created any technologies to do anything to the food before it goes into our mouths. In other words, if I stripped you down naked or, and, and shrunk you down to the size of our ancestors and said, eat, and all you had was your nails and your teeth and your little muscles and your little digestive tract, we were eating selective wild foraging, just a few different plants. And for, number one, it had to be by default, in season, hyper local, and as low in toxins as possible because we weren't processing the toxins out of the plants at that time. So a very limited vegetable diet and a bunch of insects. I mean, that's what we were eating. And it did okay. For millions of years, it supported these small bodies and, and these small brains. But when we started to, create tools and technologies, things like, again, beginning 3.3 million years ago, stone tools that allowed us to butcher uh, animals that were killed by a predator on the savanna, and we no longer needed, we, we, we didn't need huge canines to rip apart carcasses because we had a stone, a razor sharp stone tool in our hand to do that work for us. Later on, we invented hunting technology that allowed us to take down animals at will and access the most nutrient-dense part, the blood, the fat, and the organs. Then we created fire that allowed us to process food outside of our bodies, fermentation that allowed us to chemically and physically transform nutri- or raw materials into something that was already pre-digested and safer for our bodies to access nutrients and do less work to get. You know, every time uh, we... Um, access more of these uh, raw materials and the technologies that unlock the potential inside of those raw materials, we didn't need to rely on our own digestive tracts to do the work. In fact, we don't necessarily think about it that much, but digesting food is work. No matter what animal you are, you expend energy and sometimes time breaking down food inside of our bodies. If we can do it really efficiently before it goes into our bodies, we don't, we don't need to rely on, 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 on what's happening inside. So a, 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 right now, a similar sized primate, we're primates, a similar sized primate, uh, we have, when we compare ourselves to them, our guts are 60% the size of that primate. Now there's a primate that doesn't have the nutritional needs as us, right? Because we have, our brains are the most nutritionally expensive organ in our body. We have massive nutritional needs, but we have smaller digestive tracts, uh, smaller guts, and uh, we, it just speaks to the power of what we do outside of our body. So the idea is this, you know, we have, and we talked about this before, but uh, the phrase I like to use to help sort of capture this is, is the phrase domestication. You know, if, if you think about what domestication means, right, the definition of domestication, it's you're taking a wild something, plant or animal, taking it out of its wild environment, putting in an environment that humans created, a culturally modified environment. So a farm, a greenhouse, a zoo, a, a laboratory, whatever it is, we uh, in this environment that humans have created, this cultural environment, and, and we're doing things in that environment to help either 
protect that species or feed it or give it more light or do a bunch of different things to it. And over time, in that new environment, that species changes, right? And genetically changes sometimes. So it doesn't resemble the earlier version. And sometimes it can't survive back in that wild environment any longer. That's what domestication is. And, it, and I get asked all the time, well, who, well, what was the first domesticated species on the planet? Well, as far as animals are concerned, we usually think dogs, right? Dogs were, it was a co-domestication event, but could be as early as something like 35,000 years ago. Some people even suggest earlier. And then there wasn't a real animal domestication event until much later, until about eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 years ago. And as far as plants are concerned, well, you're looking at a very early date of plant domestication at around 15,000 years ago for some plants, and most of them happened between twelve and 10,000 years ago. But if you really think about the definition I laid out of domestication, where we take a species, put it in a human-created environment, that because of that new environment, uh, that species genetically changes, no longer resembles the earlier version, and can't survive on its own any longer in the wild environment outside of that cultural one, then the answer to the question, who was the first domesticated species, is us, humans. And it started at three and a half million years ago when we made our first stone tool, and we started to out-eat our digestive tract. We relied upon those. You know, we were We were accessing a diet with those tools that we couldn't access without those tools. And because that diet was getting better and more nutritious and more nutrient rich and, and just amazing, our bodies were, it was supporting the massive body and brain growth. And then all of a sudden here we are in these bodies that require nutrition that we can't provide without those technologies. That's huge. We can't provide, you put in the book, if we try to eat a completely raw unprocessed diet, we have to spend 42% of our day chewing if you're talking about primates and yeah, they have the large guts and they're spending all day just gathering leaves and fruits and whatever they can because it's such low nutrient density and they just don't know how to process foods. The turning point is we got these tools, we can process foods outside of our body to gain better nutrition. And that was a game changer. And we kept doing that and that changed our bodies. And yeah, our guts changed and we lost the ability to like have these long, large intestines to like ferment plant matter. And we just have these longer, small intestines where we can extract nutrition from animal foods, right? Absolutely. Yep. And so when I say we don't, we're not designed to eat meat, again, that doesn't mean we shouldn't eat meat. In fact, I believe, let's say animals, I like the term animals better than meat. Um, I believe the healthiest, most nourishing human diet possible is one that has at its core animal foods, an animal-based diet, and one that really, really celebrates the entirety of that animal. I, what I, and what I mean by that statement is, you know, we, we're not designed to do that. I mean, we, you know, the, there is, I, when we talked about it before, the carrier hypothesis, the idea that we can outrun any animal over, you know, the, and those, and those, those um, you know, long-distance oh, hunting. Persistence hunting. Is that a thing? Yes. It, do I think it made a, that kind of, you know, um, and, and that's more of an intellectual exercise to talk about that. Can mm -hmm. humans persistence hunt and take down a large animal? Yes. Now, if you looked at any of those, they almost always end with some kind of a spear that even if it's only five feet away, actually take down the animal, right? So, or And even if that wasn't there, you need a knife or a sharp edge to, to process the animal. So there's a tool involved. But even if, forget all that, you know, these some of these persistent hunt, persistence hunts take three or four people, they run almost a marathon distance to take this animal down. They take the animal down and then they got to bring the animal back. Hmm. So, you know, is, are, are, is, it, is it really cool to talk about? And is it really very interesting? Yes. But if we're really talking about, you know, introducing animals into the human diet and having them be, uh, you know, a mainstay, we're talking about hunting technology, you know, things hunting from a distance, spears, bows and arrows, atlatls, what, what, whatever it is. So, we require some kind of a technology to access those animals, and then we require some kind of a technology to take that animal apart. Even though that technology is as simple as busting two, you know, banging two rocks together and creating a sharp edge, it's still a technology, and we, we, we require it to overcome our nails and our inefficient teeth. But once we access that food, it's a game changer. Everything changes from that point forward. And we started hunting before we tamed fire, right? Is that how the timeline goes? So I know there's all kinds of timelines out there with different who we talk to. 
It depends on who you talk to. I like, and, and part of it is to really plant some dates. You know, it's so complicated. And, and for us to even have a conversation that involves millions of years is, is really, really difficult because, you know, just the conception, conceptualizing what millions of years really is like, especially when there's been so much change in the past hundred years and 5,000 years that, that what does that really mean? I like 2 million years as a point, somewhere around 2 million years, we start hunting and we um, domesticate fire at, at, at around the same time. It, we don't really know exactly which one came first. There are some people who would argue with me and say, no, 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 no. We don't have fire for another million years. There's some people who would argue we don't have hunting technology for another 500,000 years. I, I really like, for a variety of reasons, 2 million years as the date mm -hmm. um, for, for both of those technologies. Okay. It actually doesn't matter that much. But why is it significant? Because we always talk about nose to tail eating when we talk because we, we both love nose to tail. And my, that's what my company's called. But well, why, why is that important? Right. So, and, and this is this is why I, I paused earlier and said I don't like the term meat. I like the term yeah. animals. When we start, when we create our first stone tool and we're scavenging on the African savanna, these animals that have been killed by another predator, you know, the way that this works, and I know we talked about it before, but it's important to, to bring it up again for those who aren't going back to the beginning and <laughs> listening to all the other podcasts. So when we're confident what happened millions of years ago is the same sort of animal behavior we see still today from big predators is when a predator takes down its prey, it'll take down its prey, it'll rip it apart. It's, and it's designed to do this with its claws and its canines, rip it apart, dive in and eat the most nutrient dense bioavailable parts of that animal, the blood, the fat and the organs. And they do this and they gorge themselves. Just like many of us are going to do in a couple of days of Thanksgiving, they gorge themselves. And just like our Uncle Bob used to go do on the couch, as soon as they're done, they go off and sleep on a rock somewhere. They go off and sleep and digest that meal. When, but they leave this massive, dead, massive animal out there on the savanna, still covered in meat, covered in flesh. Now, many times they're going to come back and, and, and act. sometimes they leave and never come back. Sometimes they come back and finish, you know, use that animals as several meals. But when they leave, it provides an opportunity for animals that are designed to scavenge, right? Now, things like hyenas and buzzards. In the past, it was the ancestors to modern day hyenas and buzzards would, would swoop in and start, you know, ripping off flesh and, 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 and eating the, the flesh that's hanging there. When we didn't have the ability to, to join that party until we start making stone tools at 3.3 million years ago, and as soon as we make those tools, we start uh, finding evidence, uh, archaeological evidence of butchered, scavenged animal bones where our ancestors would run in next to the buzzards and hyena ancestors and use those tools to, to hack off huge pieces of meat. And meat comes into our diet at about 3.3 million years ago. What's significant and what you were just bringing up is the point that we don't biologically change that much when we start introducing meat into our diet. So the difference between three and a half million years ago and two and a half million years ago is not that drastic, right? We don't see massive body and brain growth. We see a little bit, but nothing massive. And there could be several reasons for that. One is, well, maybe they weren't eating that much meat. Maybe every now and then they had a little bit of meat and the archaeologists just happened to find the, you know, all the finds where that's the case. But more often than not, if you really think about it, the the ability for an archaeologist to find evidence for something that dates to millions of years ago must, in my mind, must mean there were, there were tons of examples of them, and a few of them just happened to be in the perfect situation to preserve that evidence for millions of years. So I think, you know, this is purely interpretation, but I think our ancestors loved meat. They're hacking off massive pieces of meat whenever they had access to do it, and they start eating meat. But we don't see this huge change because it's all about nutrient density and bioavailability. Meat is much more nutrient dense than the plants, uh, you know, the fruits and the and, and and the vegetables that they were while that they were harvesting or, or, or foraging for. But it's one of the least nutrient dense parts of an animal. When we start hunting at two million years ago, so almost a full million and a half years later than when we started eating meat. When we start hunting is when we see massive body and brain growth. I mean, that's what we see. So when we start hunting, the difference is when we're scavenging, we're eating the leftover meat from the predator. 
when we're hunting, we're the predator. We have first access to the entirety of that animal. We as the hunter are looking at the animal that we just harvested and say, what do we want to eat? And then we can dive in and eat the blood, the fat, and the organs. The same thing I know that you're finding. I know that Mary's finding. I know that you know every, anybody doing this sort of work is finding with, with groups around, hunter-gatherer groups around the world. They relish those same parts of the animal that the other predators, like on the African savanna, did. So that what fueled, in my mind, the um, massive body and brain growth that we see that end of, ended up creating us as a species, as modern day homo sapiens, is uh, the blood, the fat, and the organs. And some meat, and doing wonderful things to whatever wild vegetable resources we had access to to make them as safe and nourishing as possible. And, and I know we always forget this, and certainly insects. Mm -hmm. Well, insects are last in the book. I, I have a opinion about insects, but we'll get there. Let's do plants. Let's go to plants okay. because all these days they're touted as superfoods. This is the most glorious thing you could ever eat. It's, a, it's answered all our problems. And one of the first lines in your chapter on plants is plants should scare the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> that is the first line. That is a direct quote from Dr. Bill. And pesticides produced by plants themselves actually count for 99%, 99.9% of pesticides that we eat. Another it quote. Is. So you got to think about this. Dr. Yeah. Bill's not saying don't eat plants. And it's not saying we didn't eat plants. It's like, we just need to think about the context of plants. And I like to even think about it, even just a little thought experiment of what did we have back then? We didn't have Whole Foods, the, the grocery store with a thousand different things. We didn't have the, the mustard plant. I'm doing this part of the film right now. All of these brassica family vegetables like broccoli and kohlrabi and Brussels sprouts and kale, they all came from this spindly little mustard plant. This mustard plant wasn't a lot of nutrition. You know, like finding this little, you talk about foraging in the book too, which you, you can get into, but you're not foraging for like, you know, this giant kale salad that you get at Whole Foods. You're foraging for, you know, what you can find. I went to Tanzania since we last did our podcast. So now I got to be in the club with you and drink the blood and the milk with the Maasai and do all these cool things. You did it with the Samburu, same type of thing. But we were in wet season. It was not dry season. Wet season, there were not plants hanging around. There, you know, we were out there hunting for meat. They were eating meat, and then there was some tubers, and then there was one plant that I saw them eating. They had the the women were collecting pump uh, the pumpkin leaves. So they, but this is a modern thing. So they actually had a pumpkin patch up here in in this Hadza area we're in, and for whatever reason they yeah they they were able to have a little pumpkin patch and they take the leaves off and they did this whole process to get the veins out. They weren't sitting there in a garden of plants. So I'm gonna let you take it away, but I just think, I, I guess I didn't really get to the thought experiment, but if you're walking around, maybe the, the show alone is a good example of this. People, I don't watch it, but people have seen the show. People aren't eating a bunch of plants. They're out there trying to get animals and the people who make it further in the show are getting animals. You, you can't just go out there and find, you know, thousands and thousands of calories. So. Take it away. <laughs> and there's so many things we can unpack here and talk about. Uh, so that line, plants should scare the hell out of you. Well, it's sort of like the line, we're not designed to eat meat, right? It, and, it, and it's not designed to grab your attention and just leave you hanging. It's designed to make you rethink your association with a food that because of either the modern food industry or the modern nutritional world or whatever – We've been advertising, marketing, all of it. We've we've screwed up our understanding of what our relationship with this food should be. So, in order to kind of reverse that, it's like, hey, this is a bold statement. Let's let's unpack it and, and then talk about it. It is also in response to the. I, I've taught. I've been. I'm 48 years old. I've been foraging for 38 years. I've been teaching foraging classes for about 20 years, a little over 20 years, and my mindset on how I approach teaching these classes um, has changed quite a bit. I used to start all the classes um, with like, because everybody would come very scared of foraging. They were so scared that they were going to kill themselves or make somebody sick or do something, but they still, there was still this innate 
want and desire to do it, right? And, and sort of the reconnect with the world around them and maybe their ancestral ways of, of getting food, but they were really, really scared. And I sensed this. So I started to, I said, you know what? You don't need to be scared of these plants. You need to respect them and in, in, in X, Y, and Z. But I, I literally always started that way. And what I've come to find out uh, through a lot of anthropological work, but also my own struggles with things like oxalates and, and others is that, you know what? That's the wrong approach. It's, yeah, they, they, sh they shouldn't be more scared of foraging for wild plants than they should be of going in the grocery store. They should be scared of both of them, right? Or not scared, cautious. They should be wary. And the other thing I was responding to was this idea. And I remember in college, I, I've had a, a, a battle with weight my entire life. I've had a, a, a battle with food my entire life. And I grew up in the 70s and 80s, like so many people listening did, and that time period where saturated fat was bad, vegetable oil was good, margarine was good, and plants were going to save the planet even then too. And and I, re I remember going – anytime I wanted to get healthier or lose weight, I remember I would walk into the grocery store with my cart in the – I know I've talked about this before with you – in the produce section, I say, if I'm going to get healthy, this is the place to get healthy. All of these plants must be good for me. Some is good, more is better. And we let our defense, or I would let my defenses down, you know, this, this, and I wouldn't even think about it. And I just start loading my cart, you know, with all these vegetables. Half of them never even got cooked or eaten anyhow, but it was that all of this must be amazing for me. I don't have to think about food anymore. Everything's going to be solved in this produce section. And I suffered from it. And I still do from, from that sort of an approach. Plants should scare the hell out of you. You need to realize, everybody needs to realize several things. Number one, we are not designed to safely and efficiently get all of the nutrients that plants have into our bodies in the right way. We just aren't. Plants, are, do plants have nutrition in them? Absolutely. Do some plants have really cool nutrition in them? Absolutely. Do they give that nutrition up easily? No, not at all. So, and uh, the other thing is every single plant on this planet has toxins in it. They produce toxins. Some of these toxins are benign and don't do a lot and won't harm you. Some of these toxins on the other end of the spectrum will kill you outright. But most of them are in this sort of gray area where, you know what, they're there, they're they some of them will build up over time some of them can be detoxified some of them will cause problems later in life but they're 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 there in vegetables in a way that you don't feel it necessarily the next day right you don't even feel it the next month you'll feel it in 5 years or 10 years or you know when you before and you're 40 years old and you're having difficulty walking down the steps and and we've normalized some of this right oh i'm just getting old and, and I'm supposed to, my joints are supposed to ache and my feet are supposed to be swollen when I get up out of bed in the morning. Absolutely not. There is no wild animal on the planet that lives that kind of life. Wild animals live amazing lives and keel over dead. The only species on the planet that don't do that, that are, are humans and are domesticated animals that we've screwed up because of food in, in the same way. Right. And, and we end up, we say, oh, yeah, we're living longer. No, we're dying longer. We're, we're suffering the last third of our life because of the decisions that we've made when we were 15 years old and 20 years old and 25 years old. And a lot of those issues are a result of plant toxins. One of, so that's number one. So plants just scare the hell out of you. Now, I'm not, that doesn't mean we shouldn't eat plants. It does mean there are certain plants we shouldn't eat. There are some plants that we should eat in very, small amounts during only certain times of the year, like they've always been consumed for millions of years. And there are some plants that we can approach using traditional technologies that can make them safer and more nourishing. So that's, that's you know, I'll grab your attention with the plants that scare the hell out of you. And then there's a big, long discussion about how we should think about plants in our diet and, and the kind of choices that we should make to, to have them part of a nourishing, healthy diet. Yeah, and we could talk about some of those. And definitely people should buy your book and read about, you know, get the whole story. But we can cover the high level sure. of certain foods. But it, just to talk about oxalates real quick, I mean, it, that's a problem. Is So many things with nutrition is it happens over time and you don't notice it. And then the modern medicine and the doctors don't even know about it. And no one ever tells you, oh, you had this kidney stone because maybe because you ate, you know, raw kale and spinach milk smoothies. <laughs> 
you know, for three years in a row, like I did, you know, and, and, or you have all these problems with your joint pain. That's not natural. No one tells you this. The doctors don't know this, but uh, everyone that I know, and a lot of people listening, they figured out for themselves, they've cut out a lot of these plant foods. They've recognized that these anti-nutrients exist and they've gotten better for it. And it's still, I have a problem though. Some people still online. I saw someone post it the other day online, someone in the health, you know, a, a semi friend of mine. Oh, who, no one should worry about the oxalates. Like, this is insane. You have like a eating disorder. If you worry about oxalates, all this type of stuff. I'll tell a personal story real quick. Go ahead. I'll I'll tell go. A lot of times in my podcast, I don't talk. I'll, I'll, I'll talk this stuff. No, talk. Okay. I did the kale and spinach shakes for years. Then I stopped. I interviewed Sally Norton. I started researching her, you know, their stuff before, and I, and I stopped eating high oxalate foods. Then all of a sudden, last month, I got this green smooth, you know, the, um, I don't want to say the brand. There's a couple brands out there. It's like those dehydrated, uh, green smoothie powders, mm -hmm. which basically it's just dried kale dried. It's just an oxalate bomb. So I eat the same <laughs> thing every day, right? I always eat the same thing. One day I decided to try, I'm like, huh, maybe I'll see how this, you know, they sent me for free. They're trying to get me to, you know, do whatever. Tried it. I woke up in the middle of the night. And like past a kidney stone, purely fire, terrible experience was up for a full hour in agony from one scoop of the oxalate powder. Just, I mean, this stuff is real. People are like, oh yeah, like oxalate, you know, it, this stuff is real. This, this triggered. So I don't know the exact mechanism, like how I, I've been talking to some people about like why it would happen like that, like so severely and so acutely, mm -hmm. but, um, man, don't mess around. Well, let me, it. let me just throw it out there too. I, I'll do a quick version of this. Cause I, I think these, you know, that those kind of personal stories, like you might've just changed somebody's life with, with that. I mean, they're, they're more powerful than I think, um, yeah. I, we give them credit for. And by the way, Sally Norton, she's coming out with a book uh, in a couple months. Good. She's she's a she's the guru on the oxalates. I love the work that yeah. she does. Um, it is a result of you having her on the podcast, and then me interviewing her for something I was doing a couple of years ago that I actually was able to solve. I've had three medical mysteries in my life, all of them painful. All three of them, the doctors told me I was crazy and and made me feel like I shouldn't. Uh, that there was something wrong with me mentally and that it, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't real, all of them due to oxalates. And I'll, I'll give you, the, the again, the, the quick version. Um, I, ate, I, you know, I grew up like so many people in a household where you know, my parents were feeding me a uh, healthy diet, what was at least considered healthy in the 70s and 80s, which included lots of kale and lots of spinach and lots of those foods. So I, I had a lot of oxalates in my diet for a large part of my life. And then I was writing, I was co-authoring an article with a good friend of mine, Dr. Tim Mester from SUNY Potsdam. He's a great archaeologist. And we did a, a study, a experimental archaeology study on a, on a plant called Peltonja virginica, which has calcium oxalate raphide. So they're like oxalates on steroids. They look like these little needles, these bundles of needles under a microscope that have this protease compound. And if you eat the plant, your throat, it, it releases, it pierces the inside of your your, mm. your skin and your throat and it releases this toxin and, and your throat swells up and you die. But meanwhile, John, this plant, John Smith comes up uh, and sees in the early spring Native Americans eating a bunch of this plant and describes how they detoxified it. Well, anyhow, to make a very long story short, we did a bunch of experiments with uh, with detoxifying it and, and, and relate it back to the archaeological record. And then when I was done, a foraging buddy of mine said, hey, um, Listen, you know, skunk cabbage, you know, skunk cabbage, does it grow by yeah. you? Uh, it, it looks like a cabbage in the middle of the woods, uh, usually by streams. And if you break the leaf, it actually smells like a skunk. He said, you know, skunk cabbage has the same uh, calcium oxalate raphides. And, you know, I wonder, this is him talking, and this is me years ago and really naive about the whole thing. And he's like, I wonder if we can make a, a, a broth, a vegetable broth out of it and maybe take the nutrition out of it, but leave the, leave the bad stuff behind. Like, I don't know. So he made a big pot of it and we tried it. The next day, two days later, I was teaching an archaeology field school back here in Maryland. And I, you know, I was jumping on shovels all day long and doing stuff that we do in our archaeological. So not jumping on shovels, but digging in the ground, right? With my feet. And I, and I, and I get into the car and I was driving the students back to their dorms. 
and I felt like my foot, I broke my foot. I felt like I broke my toe. Like, man, I guess I broke my toe, but I had been doing so many things that day that mm-hmm. I, it wasn't out of the question that that would have happened. So I, I barely got him dropped off. And I called my wife and I said, Christina, I, I am going to the hospital. Like I'm, I'm actually in so much pain. I'm going to the hospital. So I went to the hospital and we live in a pretty, you've been here, a little rural area and the hospital is kind of small. Anyhow, we go, in, I go in there, they x-rayed my foot and came back and they said, listen, um, you didn't break your foot. You have gout. Mm. I'm like, I do not have gout. I do not eat any a gouty diet. And I was actually insulted that they said it and that bothered me. They know you have gout. They never tested me for uric acid, by the way. Um, so they said, you have gout. You need to stop eating meat. You need to eat all these vegetables and do all these things. I, so anyhow, I go back home and it's bothered me forever. Uh, finally, it went away. And then the next thing that happens, oh, I'm sorry. And then at the same time, that same week, I was driving home and my eyes, I was getting incredibly light sensitive. Now I have two corneal transplants that had happened 21 years ago, but I, and these transplants have been fine since then. All of a sudden I got really, really light sensitive, so bad that I couldn't see the television at night like the television was too bright for me it was so bad that i ended up having to pull over on the side of the road i was wearing two pair of sunglasses one on top of the other my wife had to pick me up so we go up to my corneal specialist that did the transplants and i said listen i, I literally can't eat. I, I had two pairs of sunglasses on walking into his office my wife had to drive me there and i said listen something's wrong with my eyes and he checks me out you know looks at me and does all the stuff he does and and he says no, there's nothing wrong with you I said, well, I, I'm, I can't keep my eyes open. There's tears run, literally running down my face. And he said, listen, here's um, this medicine. Uh, it's the only medicine in the world that I, 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 I ever took like on a long term. And he said, I'm going to give you this. It's not going to solve the problem, but it's going to make your eyes. It's going to numb your eyes. It's called Keterolac. It's eye drops. He says, it's like aspirin for the eyes. So you take this and then we'll try to wean you off it in a couple months. And I was on those drops for seven years and i tried to get off them i try i try i hate taking medicine i tried to get off them. i couldn't get off them so finally i talked to sally norton right mm-hmm. and i'm telling her these stories and and then i i told her about that soup thing that i had and she says you didn't have you didn't have um uh gout yeah. he said you had yeah. pseudo gout he said it, it was oxalic acid it was it wasn't uh, uric acid and so i and then, um, I, you know, with my eyes, I started looking. It turns out corneas are a place that the oxalates can deposit. And then the only other thing, and I know this is a long story, but again, I think it's incredibly important. I had an issue with, with neck pain on one side of my neck, and it lasted an entire year. And it was happening right at that time I talked to Sally. And I talked to Sally, and I said, you know, what are the oxalates that are in my diet still? I've, I've, I've cut almost all of them out. What is it? And it was almonds. You know, almonds were my go-to snack. And it was a handful of almonds here, a handful of almonds there, which really quickly can can multiply. I cut almonds out, oxalates out of my diet. Seven years, twice a day, I was taking those eye drops. I haven't taken an eye drop in two years. Um, the neck pain went away. Never had a problem again with my feet. And it was it, here in every instance, doctors were telling me I was crazy. There were no explanations whatsoever, and it was something I was doing to myself every single day, thinking I was eating a healthy diet, and I was I was flooding my body with oxalates. Well, that's why plants should scare the hell out of you. People need to hear these stories. I yeah, I mean, it's good that you know we both told our stories. It's serious, and so many people have these things, and they're they might go undiscovered unless they start paying attention to this stuff. I always like to mention this vegan website I found that's warning about all that plant and nutrients. I don't have any more. I brought it up in the Sally Norton podcast, but they even know the vegans will know you need to detoxify these foods. You need to prepare them properly. You need to do this. So let's jump into some of these preparation methods sure, because absolutely. Cause people ask me too. They're like, Oh, you know, how did someone just asked me two days ago, how did uh, these South American cultures get away with eating all this corn and maize and beans and all this stuff that doesn't seem, you know, Right. How is that possible? And Dr. Bill went down there and figured it out. So we'll start with it. We'll start with that because there's lectins in beans and uh, phytic acid in corn and maize. Same thing kind of. Uh, so, yeah. How did how did they do it? Well, first off, what I'm going to tell you, except for maybe one or two examples, are going to seem so incredibly simple that it, it, you're going to think it's, it can't be that simple. But it is. Remember, these detoxification strategies were being done 
in 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 caves and clay pots with a you know or, or with minimal tools and equipment for thousands tens of thousands of years and it doesn't require somebody in a lab coat to modify our food to get it ready for us in fact if that's happening then you should be you should be wary of it it's very simple things in some cases it involves soaking sometimes it's sprouting sometimes it's fermenting sometimes it's combining soaking and cooking sometimes it's eating a food with another food at the same time and i'll give you a few examples Sometimes it's a, an alkaline fermentation, something like nishtamalization, which is what you would do uh, with maize. So a couple of really quick examples, um, kind of that co-eating thing, you know, eating one thing with another at the same time can be incredibly powerful. So one thing we see just about every animal on the planet doing is uh, g- engaging in is geophagy, which is the intentional consumption of earth or clay. Now. When humans do it, we used to regard it as something called pica or pica, which uh, was considered an eating disorder, kind of on the same scale of eating lead paint or eating pencils or something like that. But the reality is when humans eat earth or clay or dirt, for lack of a better term, they're engaging in a practice that is millions of years old and just like every other animal on the planet does. So we eat earth or clay for two major reasons. One is for... uh, if we're low in certain minerals, sometimes we can get that from eating certain types of certain types of clays, for example. Um, the other reason, and a powerful reason, is for detoxifying the plants that we're consuming at the same time. And I know Brian and I have talked about this before, but some of the research I've done was in Bolivia with uh, Aymara Indians who still practice something called um, pasa, which is the uh, consumption of clay at the same time that they're eating potatoes. And literally, when we, were, when we were doing it, the most toxic potatoes I ate the entire time I was in South America were the ones that we ate with this clay. And it was every bite, every bite. The first thing, the potato went in the clay, and then they took a bite. Then it went in the clay, and, they, and then they, they took a bite of it. And it was actually, first off, it tasted very good. The clays um, were very pleasant. The two different clays we had had two completely different flavors. And I like to say that the story that I like to tell around it was at the end of it, we had eaten all the potatoes, but there was still some clay left in the two bowls. And it was, it was about the texture of a thick mayonnaise really was what we were dipping the potatoes in. And it was just clay water and salt. And the youngest daughter of the family that I was staying with and working with, um, picked up the bowls when, when all the potatoes were eaten and she took her finger and used it to swipe the inside of the bowl, just like my youngest daughter does with mayonnaise. And then she ate all the rest of it. And and it really went to show the two takeaways from this was number one. Um, this wasn't like this chore, this weird, disgusting thing that everybody hated to engage in when they had to do it. It was, it was, a, it was part of, it was part of that family and that group's um, identity. It was part of their tradition. It was part of their food system. And it was something they actually looked forward to. That clay didn't get discarded. That clay got consumed, the leftover, consumed with a huge ear-to-ear smile. And the second thing that was so powerful about it is I went down to South America and Bolivia and Peru specifically to study different uh, potato detoxification strategies. And the most and the most toxic potatoes we consumed the entire time I was there were the ones that were eaten with the clay, which I think really uh, speaks to the power of, of, of that clay. There's a lot of evidence in places like um, everywhere from California, from California, Native Americans, all the way to um, Sardinia, where egg corns are consumed with at the same time as clay because the tannic acid will bind with the clay and, and pass through their body. So that co-eating thing is one example. Soaking is another you know, one of the things that we need to do if we're thinking about plants and strategies for plants and, and how we consume different parts of plants to do different things, the things that we should be excited about that don't require usually as much processing are the parts of the plants that the plant genetically through evolutionary processes are using to attract, right? Yeah. They, so flowers and fruit are there because they, you know, and they're beautiful and they smell good and they taste good and they're usually low, usually low in toxins because the idea is they want to attract insects to pollinate or uh, in the case of flowers, or they want to attract animals to come eat the fruit and deposit the seeds somewhere else. So typically, not across the board, typically fruits are low in toxins and flowers are low in toxins. The, the stalk of the plant is needed. 
right? This, the leaves are incredibly important. The roots are incredibly important, especially especially for high starch uh, plants, where that's the, that's literally the the energy powerhouse of the plant, and that plant is doing everything it can to protect that part of the plant. So we usually have to be concerned about those. But the thing we really need to be concerned about are the um, reproduction uh, parts of the plant, the beans, the or beans or legumes, the seeds, the grains, the nuts. Those are the parts of the plant that are designed. They're designed to make it through your entire digestive tract. I mean, that's what they do. Right? They're physically and chemically designed. The shape of, think about a watermelon seed. That thing is made to go in your mouth and come out your butt. I mean, that, that it's, it, it's a rocket. That's what it does. And it chemically is there to protect it from anything your digestive tract throws at it so that it gets, it gets deposited in a, in a pile of manure. And when it's in the right conditions, can let down its defenses and sprout and produce new life. It is not meant for us to eat. It doesn't mean we can't find ways to eat them. That means in its raw state, going into our bodies, it's not meant for, for us to eat. So what do we do? Well, we trick it. The best way to go about it is to trick it into thinking it's in that place where it can let down its defenses, its chemical defenses, and then uh, you know sprout and support new life. Soaking, sprouting, fermenting are the, are the three main ones. Now, there are some things like a red kidney bean is the example I use in the book. Red kidney beans are incredibly dangerous. Just three or four of them raw will land you in the hospital. Red kidney beans have been known to kill people in their raw state. The only way to fully process a red kidney bean and make it as safe as it can be is to go through a combination of soaking, preferably in an alkaline solution. So you can add a little bit of baking soda to the water, which raises the pH and helps, but soaking and cooking. Now, and that's great. And, and, and if you look at traditional, anybody traditionally dealing with things like beans in their diet are, are soaking it. Many of them are soaking it in, in a slightly alkaline solution, and then they're cooking it. One of, and I just want to throw it out there because this is important. One of the uh, problems today with, I, 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 love, I love Instapots. I do. I use an Instapot. It can do a lot of great things. But the problem is, um, with, as far as beans are concerned, you know, they have the ability, and, they, and the companies advertise, these pressure cookers advertise that they have the ability to take a raw, I'm sorry, a dried bean, like a kidney bean, and cook it without soaking it and, and, and put it in its soft enough state for us to eat. And it can because of the pressure. The problem is it hasn't gone through both of those steps that are necessary to detoxify it. Whether If you have a pressure cooker or not, you still need to soak your beans, your dried beans overnight, and then cook them the next day. So we have, again, um, eating uh, some things you would eat with, uh, with earth or clay, some things you might soak, sprout, ferment, or do a combination of those some things you might cook. And another great example um, is, and it's in the maize chapter, is, is nishtamalization, which is the only way for uh, to process maize, the most widely grown grain in the world, but also one of the most difficult grains for the human body to uh, access all the nutrition that it can provide from it. The only way to access it fully is to put it through a process known as nishtamalization, which is an ancient process where you take the maize, you put it in an alkaline solution, simmer it, uh, and then the next day, rinse off the skins and then do whatever you're going to do with it. But it's that it's that overnight soak in an alkaline simmering and then soak in an alkaline solution that ends up uh, processing it properly and breaking it down. So beans, nuts and seeds are regarded as the healthiest things on the planet that everyone's talking about. <laughs> and you're just saying, rightly so, that these are the most protected from the plant's perspective, the most anti-nutrients, they have these defense systems, these are these natural pesticides that all plants have. And they are concerned the most in these things that we think are safe and are we think are healthy. When it's so crazy. So to zoom out, you're telling us a story of all these ancient cultures always had ways to detoxify all the different plant foods. And we could eat meat Oh, well, we should get into dairy, actually. But we'll just say say the organs, the meat, the, the most nutritious parts, the meat, the blood, the fat. The, I mean, sorry, the organs, the blood, the fat. We could eat these raw. We, we could just eat these raw. And you could eat meat raw, right? Well, you could cook, and then you could cook any of them, and it's fine. But they're all safe, and they're all bioavailable to us. All the plant foods you're mentioning, we they all of our ancestors, without you know a science lab, 
figured out that they needed to detoxify them. And now no one knows this anymore, except there are people, you know, in, in certain countries that know this, and there are a few people that still do these practices. But in Western civilization, I don't know a lot of people that are soaking, sprouting, fermenting. No, no. And here's the thing. I, I, it sounds so complicated. And one of the things that I am trying to find a way to get across without scaring people is that, hey, these are things that we, we need to be aware of. That I, 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 everybody finds convenience or comfort in not having to think about their food. That's sort of like I mentioned earlier that I, when I used to go into the produce section and just let my, down my defenses and say, oh God, I don't have to think about it anymore. Let me just load this up. Hmm. You know, there, listen, we're talking about keeping ourselves and our families and those around us as safe and nourished as possible. That comes with a responsibility. There is no part of, and, and I'm sorry, but there is no part of nourishing ourselves that doesn't require thought and hard work, right? It, 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 it is. And, and we should be excited that we live in a world that we're, we can, we, you, know, you and me are on opposite sides of the, of the country right now. Well, not, not as far as we used to be, but you're in Texas, I'm in, I'm in Maryland, and, and we're having this conversation and we're sharing it with as many people that want to access it as possible. There's, we've never had the opportunity to exchange more information than now about our food and where it comes from and how to prepare it. And many of us are sitting there just like, I just don't want to think about it anymore. Just tell me what to eat and I'll go buy it from Whole Foods. And that's not the way that it works, right? But the, the, at the same time, I also want to get across, we're talking about very simple, very, very simple things, soaking, sprouting fermenting. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I, if you put just about any vegetable and add 2% salt and put it in a jar and submerge it in water, you will ferment it and it'll be better than it was. And, and it took you five minutes to prep it and 10 days to wait. And all of a sudden, I mean, that's literally how easy some of these things are. So it's more, hey, what I'm, what I'm hoping to do with this book is provide that foundation to better understand our ancestral dietary past better understand some of the major food categories uh, in which we're eating from and also get you to take that step. Like, you know what? Okay. I am, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get a Mason jar and a little bit of salt and ferment something. Or, you know what? I know that I'm never going to go and hunt an elk and drag it into my living room and take it apart, but I am going to go to the grocery store and buy a whole chicken instead of just the chicken breast. And you know what? That little bag that has the liver and the heart and the gizzard and the neck in it, I'm actually going to do something with those. And those steps may seem so small, but they are powerful, especially when that's the first step towards this, this much longer, this much longer path that, you know, just gets a little bit more and more and more nutrient dense and a little bit more and more nutrient bioavailability, bioavailable and a little bit more and more safe. And those small incremental changes can make all the difference over a lifetime. It is. And it is a journey. And yeah, you, you don't have to do it overnight. And I always talk about this journey that I went on. And I actually had a big step in my journey yesterday. Yesterday, I went to Rome Ranch. It's a cool spot. It's Force of Nature. People may have may know Force of Nature. It's a good brand um, of you know people doing the same thing we're doing at Nose to Tail. They're they're great. So they invited me out and some other people. We got to catch our catch as in you know grab our own turkey by the leg, kill it, split it, de blood it, de blood. Is there a name for that? <laughs> to get bleed it, bleed it out. <laughs> yeah, uh, it take, out. de feather it. Do everything. We got the boning knife. I took the legs off, opened it up, pulled all the organs out, did the whole thing by myself. And then it, awesome. it went in the package at the end. And that's when it hit me because they're talking about, oh, this is going to be this whole process and you're going to understand your food better and this and that. And, you know, I kind of got kind of moment. And, you know, when I you put the stun gun to the head, the, you have this little like pneumatic thing that that kills it instantly. I didn't even it was just like I just happened. I just did it. I didn't feel anything. I was just doing it. And it was all in the moment. It, it hit me when I, we put in the package because they put in the bag and I had their little, nice little sticker on it. I'm like, oh, my God, that's just like the turkey you get in the store. It looks just like it. I just did that. It was like it took like six minutes. So yeah. I'm like, there isn't some big mystery out there of like how it gets into the bag anymore. It's like I had a live turkey in my hand and it was in a bag exactly like you see in a grocery store. hundred percent. Right. They, you know, they did the whole thing. With their sticker, yeah, and yep. uh, and then it hit me. I was like, okay, I get it now. Like this is you, you need to do this process because then you you get it. So do they do that? 
did they do that just for you or do they do that in general? Or for I that think they do that for the public. This was a special like invited guest type of thing. So there was like a small group of invited people, but I think they do it to the public as well. Yes. You know, I, that, that, first of all, I did, I did see uh, you post about that. That's fantastic. And I, yeah. I, I love, I love that. And I, and I, I know that feeling it is this, listen, I, and I, I say it all the time. I've been hunting since, well, before I was, before I was 10. Uh, so almost 40 years worth of, of hunting. And I have never once felt, you know, enjoyed the process of killing something. And most people who don't hunt, especially those who, um, uh, are anti hunting think that that's what it's all about. This, mm-hmm. this, you know, this, this morbid, I just want to go kill something sort of a thing. And to me, that's the part of it that I don't enjoy the most. It, I, I do feel a sense of responsibility to do it and do it very, very well and as cleanly and as quickly and humanely as possible. But everything leading up to, and this is exactly you know what you just described with with the turkey. Everything leading up to the hunt, the uh, you know scouting, setting up a stand, understanding the the movement of the animals, you know, getting outside, being with my son or my daughter, whatever, it, all of that getting up early in the morning and all of uh, watching the woods come alive. And if anybody, if no, if somebody listening hasn't watched the woods come alive and, uh, you know, go into the woods when it's dark and then just listen, you know, watch the sun come up and listen to the animals, all of it, it's magical. All of that I enjoy and find a huge amount of value in. Then there's the part where the animal's killed. And then to me, the most rewarding part is from that instant forward. You know, it's how can I honor the life of that animal? How can I make the use, you know, make the most use of that animal to nourish my family in the best way possible? And and everything from that point forward is is where I find. Now, there's a lot of work there, absolutely, but that's the part that to me I find the most rewarding. Unfortunately, all of that is taken away from us as modern consumers when they start with exactly where you ended your story. You ended your story with the bag. Mm-hmm. And that's where most people's story starts. And none of that initial part, whether you're raising the animal and harvesting it or you're out hunting the animal and harvesting it, you know, all, all of that's where, again, the, the, the magic takes place and that connection. And listen, you know, I, I talk about so people say to me, I, I have not. What are you telling us to be hunters and gatherers and we have to hunt all of our food and forage for all of our food? No, no. <laughs> oh, and there's not enough resources for all of us to do that. Anyhow, if we wanted to, it's not that's not what I'm talking about. That what you just described was so powerful, you will never forget it, right? You'll never forget that, uh, what you did. You go fishing once a year, at least once a year. Go to a farm like Brian just talked about one time. Take the, make sure you take the kids with you and they're a part of it as well. You know, go. There. F- were there? That's yeah. awesome. I mean, that, that's what we need to do. Yeah. That's the reconnection. That's, that's amazing. Well, this is what you said on, on a previous podcast. You do it once. Do it once yeah. at least. And you, you, I think this was a Sapien podcast we did with Dr. Gary. You're like everything, at least do it once. Maybe you don't have to do the entire sourdough and the slow fermenting and the whole thing. You know, maybe you can find a neighbor or a grocery, you know, some markets, you know, have the real sourdough. But do it once so you know how to do it. Mm-hmm. That, I, that's yep. what, yeah, that's your message. Just do each, each, yeah, do the turkey once. Do the sourdough once. And, and you know what? And talk about it. This is this is another thing. It, it, I hope who, uh, I don't know who you're having Thanksgiving with. I don't know if that turkey is going to be there. But, you know, I can imagine sitting around that table with you. If I was with you, you and you'd be telling that story about harvesting that turkey. Now, most people would say, oh, my gosh, that's the most morbid thing ever. I don't want to even think about it. Don't tell me. I just want to eat my food and not think about it. Mm-hmm. That's the worst. That's the worst response ever. Like, think about cave paintings where you have nothing but animals and people throwing spears. And think about the, the, the meals around the fires after a big hunt where they're telling the stories of the hunt. I mean, that is connection. That's honoring the life of that animal. That's understanding where your food comes from. Buying a chicken breast that doesn't look like any animal part on the planet in a styrofoam container, cooking it, making sure, my God forbid, there's no blood on the plate and nobody's talking about animals at dinner is the status quo today, but is it's the worst thing possible. And you know, telling a story like that at Thanksgiving while you're eating that turkey is amazing. I mean, that, that that's amazing. 
Yeah, I I love it. I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad um, I did the blood and the milk too. There's so many things we could have talked about. I, I got to let you go. This is a late night podcast we're doing actually. Man, I'm actually going to Costa Rica to see Mary once again and her oh. great fiance, Draco. And we're going to have Thanksgiving and Salvino. Paul, Paul was there at the turkey harvest. And okay. uh, he's going to be there for Thanksgiving as well in Costa Rica. So we'll get together. In, Tell them uh, all hello for me. That's awesome. What a great Thanksgiving. Yeah. We got the all-star, the nutrient density all-stars with Paul and Mary. And we just need Bill there. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll be there in spirit. All right. All right, so we'll wrap this up. I'll leave everyone with, well, go to the Sapien podcast. We interviewed Dr. Bill and his wife, Christina. We're going to get That's Dr. Right. Bill on with Dr. Gary soon. So we'll have more. Anything that we missed in this episode, we can do in the Sapien podcast. Get the book, Eat Like a Human. Is it eatlikeahuman.com? Can you go there? Eatlikeahuman.com's website. Yep, absolutely. And follow Dr. Bill on what, Instagram? Is that is that your main one? Instagram is the main one. So at Dr. Bill Schindler, at Dr. Bill Schindler. Yep. And then if anybody's interested with, uh, you know, my wife and I have started, we're actually make, we're making this book come to life uh, with the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, which we launched a few months ago. So you can check out any information about the Modern Stone Age Kitchen and our classes uh, and our food at modernstoneagekitchen.com. And did you see that? Did you see our sign go up the other day? Oh, yeah, I did. You got like a real deal sign. Yeah, the, on the old food lab. You gotta, you have got to see this thing in person. So, real quick, anybody's listening. So, the, the, the logo on the book and the logo we've sort of adopted is, um, it's a, a an old stone axe crossed with a modern uh, chef's knife, and behind it is um, is is a fire. And it's just that idea of you know these ancient technologies, but fusing the old and the new together. So, I uh, an amazing local uh, woodworker did all the wood for the sign, and a and a, and a, and a talented local uh, metal worker did the metal for the sign, and I made the the stone piece for the axe, and it's it's full blown. It's you know this thing's five feet high, three dimensional, hanging off the wall. I absolutely love it. I can't wait to show it to you in person. Oh man, I'm gonna come back to yeah the the food lab. You guys took over the food lab, and you're doing all kinds of good stuff. I'll throw in a plug. We had an amazing, amazing meal. We had a dinner throughout of the evolutionary ages. I don't know what we called it. Dining through history, something. Yeah. Such an amazing meal. And you do all these products where you believe in, yes, eating natural foods and, you know, clean diet, animal-based diet and stuff. But you're trying to make the fun foods and the bread foods in the best way possible. So people who want to enjoy them or they have kids, it's, you do all the methods you talk about with the slow fermentation and then even the nixtamalization and all this stuff. And you're trying to make those available to people who want to indulge in those. Absolutely. I would never, I, and I was talking with Paul the other day and I told him this, this, I would never tell somebody who doesn't eat bread to start eating bread, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that eat bread. And if you're going to eat bread, the safest and most nourishing form possible is a real, true, slow, wild fermented sourdough bread. So that's just one example. Those things, fermented dairy products and this tamalized maize products. So if you're anywhere near us on the East Coast, we'd love to have you come by and see us. And um, we can show you some of our food. All right. Good stuff. I will make sure I get out there soon to see it all in person once again. Thanks, Bill. And I'll see you in Austin in the summer. Oh, yeah. Let's make it happen. Good. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Brian. Have a great Thanksgiving. Tell everybody I said hello, and thanks for having me on. It was great to talk with you. All right. Thanks so much. I'll see you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing with our friend. Thanks for giving a review on iTunes or the podcast app. Please give us a review. Go back to episode one. Start from there. Go to nosetail.org. Get the amazing meat snacks, the biltong, the seasonings, and the body care products. And if you're in Texas or nearby, get the meat. We actually may be up and running by the time you hear this. So see if we have meat available on nosetail.org. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week.